Our final speaker this morning, our final scientific speaker this morning, is Dr. Hilary Blumberg. Uh, Dr. Blumberg runs a, a research program here at Yale in uh, the study of bipolar disorder, it, deploying things you've already heard about, neuroimaging behavioral techniques uh, to try to understand its symptoms, how to treat them, and how they develop over the course of a lifetime. Uh, Hilary, thank you for joining us today. Good morning. I just lost my mic, it fell, I'm gonna to try to reset it here. Can you hear me now, upstairs? Okay, terrific. Okay. So, good morning again. I wanna thank everybody for being here this morning. Before I left, I got a massively uh, teased for the color of my suit by my husband and son, who's <laughs> who said, are you trying to show how happy you are it's spring, looking like a big orange tulip? <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I am very happy that it's spring, and, um, it, and it finally seems so. But I'm also very appreciative of everybody who's here, because you could very well be outside. Um, on this beautiful day. And so I'm very appreciative that you're here and that I'll have a chance to tell you about some of the work that we're doing. The reason, aside from that, that actually I am wearing the bright orange is uh, in honor of the most important part of today, and that is to honor Paul Dalio and his wonderful creative work, Touch With Fire, as well as his other very important advocacy work you'll be hearing more about, so fire, if you get that. And actually, Paul and I have, we've been to a few talks together where actually some speakers actually have had things that look like flames. I didn't have that today. <laughs> As you can see, we, um, we take our work very seriously. We don't always take ourselves very seriously um, within this. Um, but um, in that vein, um, uh, uh, what, what we're all trying to tell you about is, in fact, um, very serious. And um, if I convey uh, one or two points to you today, what you've probably already had a sense of from the different talks today is that we are talking about serious medical illnesses diabetes, has stuff going on with the pancreas, there's cardiac disease and pulmonary disease, and we're talking about very serious medical diseases of the brain. So I hope to show you data that will support this idea, so you'll walk away with the sense that bipolar disorder is a disorder of the brain, and then secondly, that it's a disorder of brain development that things can change over time in the disorder in the brain, that there may be a path through development, particularly during adolescence, that can lead to the disorder, and there may be changes even over time, as I'll explain. And that's actually a very important and hopeful idea. Because if the disorder is progressing and changing, that means that if we can understand how it's doing that, then we have potential ways to get in to prevent the progression, to reduce suffering, and to improve prognosis. And so those are some of the major goals of our program and what I'll be telling you about. My talk will be divided primarily into three parts. So in the first part, I'll be telling you about this a developmental model we have. I'll be telling you a little bit about bipolar disorder, reviewing some of it. Some of the other speakers have uh, touched on that. I'm gonna do it with a focus on when we're thinking about this brain circuitry model for bipolar disorder and for its development, how we're kind of thinking through the symptoms and the life course of bipolar disorder to get to that brain model. So I'll be mostly focused there in the first part. In the second part, I'll get to my fancy brain imaging uh, pictures from our work, so the evidence from our research. And then in the last part, 
I'll tell you about some of the directions we're going in now, how we're drawing on some of the pieces of the puzzle that you've been hearing from other speakers, drawing on uh, information we're learning from genetics um, and some other areas, and some new ways we're thinking about um, treatment and intervention. OK, so first, as mentioned, I'm just going to briefly go over the symptoms of bipolar disorder with the idea of building this brain model with you. So um, as all here are probably more familiar in depression, which is actually a more common episode. Individuals with bipolar disorder spend more time in depressive episodes. So they tend to, like any other disorder, there's huge variation in terms of numbers of episodes and severity and so forth. But in general, there's more time spent in depression, and probably more folks here are familiar with in depression, at its core, there's this decrease in mood, the low mood. And in all these mood disorders, I think what often grabs us the most, um, it, and what's sort of stri most striking interpersonally, are these emotional changes when you sit with someone who's depressed and they look so sad and down. And indeed, that's so important, and that's the suffering that we would like to relieve with our treatment. But that said, these other constellation of symptoms are very important within the mood disorders. So it's, they're not just disorders of emotions, although those are important and they grab us, but they're disorders that actually reflect differences in a wide range of symptoms that actually suggest that, although at the core, there's emotional circuitry that's involved, that there are also parts of the brain that are involved in some of the most primitive or basic processes, like sleep. And you probably know if someone has mood symptoms, one of the first things that you might see is a change in sleep. And that's what heralds the onset of an episode. Changes in appetite, changes in sex drive. So you have some of these more primitive parts of the brain. You kind of meet in the middle of the brain in emotional circuitry. And then, uh, as Dr. Perlson, you know, very eloquently uh, described, you can then also have the involvement of some of the higher cortices so that there can be changes in thought and in psychotic type symptoms. So if we're going to build a brain model for mood disorders, we need to account for that span of symptoms. Mania is the hallmark of bipolar disorder. So one manic episode or a hypomanic episode, which is a little less severe, <clears throat> would make for the diagnosis of either bipolar one with the mania or bipolar two with the hypomania. And so by our diagnostic standards, one of those episodes would lead to the diagnosis. And as you can see again, central, to a manic or hypomanic episode is this change in emotional state. Now, instead of down, it's elevated, which could be either euphoric or really uncharacteristically irritable. And at the same time, very important are the other constellation of symptoms. Very important in mania, often again, one of the first signs that someone might be headed towards a manic episode is their sleep decreases. So now we're talking about a high energy state where there's decreased sleep but high activity. So someone's sleeping very little, but they're ready to do lots of things. And indeed, they are doing many things. And unfortunately, it's not just a, a happy state. It's a state of excess where many of the things that they might be doing may be causing a lot of harm to themselves and their family, which is why it's important to intervene. Uh, another key feature of the mood disorders is that they're episodic. So individuals tend to, again, there's always exceptions and there's a lot of heterogeneity, but individuals tend to have episodes. And this is a theoretical life course, just really squished, um, where across, we're looking at age. Going up, we're looking at manic symptoms and down depressive symptoms. So in this case, what you can kind of see uh, in the beginning is that maybe there was a child who had some symptoms of depression, some activated symptoms, 
parent thought maybe something was up, but there was no diagnosis. The full expression of bipolar disorder hadn't shown itself. And then by puberty, which can sometimes be the case, puberty and adolescence, now a more severe type of episode starts to show itself. Often, that, as depicted here, that's a depression. And that's a very important problem for us to solve in the field because we can't currently tell whether if someone presents with depression, aside from knowing their family history, whether that's the depression of bipolar disorder or whether they'll go on only to have depressions. And then what I'm trying to depict here is that untreated, there can be an increase in the severity and the frequency and the length of episodes. So what we're trying to do is not, not wipe out the important everyday ups and downs that are so important to the human experience, but to decrease these more severe episodes. And that's a goal of our, our program is to decrease acutely the suffering and then also to try to see if we can prevent this further progression and improve prognosis. And importantly, if episodes can be controlled in the mood disorders, then someone can feel well and do anything it is that they would like to do, uh, including doing some of the most important things, such as the great creative work of Paul Dalio. Importantly also, bipolar disorder is associated with one of the highest suicide risks of the psychiatric disorders. It's estimated that as many as 50% of individuals who have bipolar disorder in their lifetime will make a suicide attempt. And as many as 10 to 15%, 20% by some estimates, may ultimately die by suicide. I describe that Bipolar disorder often really starts to emerge in adolescence. So does suicide thoughts and behaviors. And so we're very interested in thinking about how to prevent suicide. So we are part of our program then is to look at that kind of inextricable link between this development of bipolar disorder and the development of the suicidal ideation and behavior during this adolescent and young adult critical period. And probably the most important part of this slide is this last part that I've put up, which is that there's evidence that treatment can reduce risk of suicide. The most research has been done with lithium and in adults. There are some other bits of evidence with other medications, and I think it's importantly the overall proof of concept that interventions can reduce risk of suicide. So bringing those pieces together, how important it can be to prevent progression, to reduce the suffering of the uh, associated symptoms, and to prevent suicide, kind of in, you know, in some is related to the mission of what we study. So now I'll show you a bit about how we study it and the brain model. So you've heard um, a lot of wonderful talks about um, the brain and brain imaging, and my apologies that some of this is going to be repetitive. I don't know who was here for what parts, so I'm just going to get everybody on the same page. <clears throat> so the picture of the brain is the same way that I'm standing. So front of the brain, back of the brain. And again, we're going to be talking a lot about the prefrontal cortex. And as Dr. Pittenger and others were talking about, we're especially interested in some of these disorders these emotional disorders, um, disorders of impulse control and anxiety in this lower part of the prefrontal cortex, as Dr. Pittenger described, above the eye orbits, so orbital frontal cortex, or I might describe it as ventral prefrontal cortex in the top, ventrals underneath, dorsals on top. So in the mood disorders, we're especially interested in this ventral part of prefrontal cortex because it's so central to regulating emotions and impulses that are central in the mood disorders and bipolar disorder. I have it colored here for simplicity, and it's an illustration, but in the cool blue color, 
because for the most part, particularly in mania, we can see decreases in prefrontal cortex, in ventral prefrontal cortex, and bipolar disorder. Uh, Dr. Perlson um, told you about the many elegant nuances of that, and we can talk about that um, after. But for exposition to tell you about this idea about development, for now, I'm going to mostly generalize to the thought of prefrontal cortex having lower activity in bipolar disorder. Another important part of the brain in emotion processing and regulation is the amygdala. So now the prefrontal cortex, this folded, executive, late to evolve cortex that makes us human with all these advanced thoughts and ways to, uh, to behave adaptively, that's uh, stuff that continues to mature during adolescence and young adulthood when there are structures deeper in the brain they tend to underlie processes that are more primitive, more important to sort of basic life functions. And as I'll allude to, also tend to mature earlier because we need them pretty early on. So one of those in emotional processing is the amygdala. So in contrast to this really folded prefrontal cortex, deep in the temporal lobes of the brain that kind of sit out here is this gray matter nugget it's named after the Greek word for almond, and it's called the amygdala. And that's very important in more basic emotional processes. And so a, um, <clears throat> a way to potentially illustrate that is um, my kids who, including the one who teased me about the suit now, who's fully grown. But <laughs> in any case, um, that's not the only time they've teased me. And so, Sometimes they've called me in a room, there's a snake in the room, there's a snake in the room. Now they love snakes and I would often buy them toy snakes. So um, my amygdala would probably be the, you know, bright, so my face and the amygdala would probably be the kind of bright orange and red hot um, as, as what I'm wearing, seeing that snake there. And that's the quicker, more primitive, but important response if that was a real snake, but then the other parts of my brain are taking all the different information I have and experience. My complicated, more complex frontal lobe is saying, wait a minute, you just bought them toy snakes yesterday. That's one of those. This is fine. You know, don't move. Just yell at them for, you know, pretending it's a real snake. <laughs> but, and so what the frontal cortex tends to do is to do that. It takes all the other information from the brain, processes, and it tends to put the brakes on the activity of other structures in the brain so there aren't maladaptive behavioral responses. And how does it do that? It does it through the connections, which tend to be inhibitory to put the brakes on. So there are extensive connections between the amygdala and this ventral part of prefrontal cortex. And so you might be able to imagine from what I've discussed that there could be emotion regulation problems in bipolar disorder if you had trouble in the amygdala or the ventral prefrontal cortex or in the connections because this, it's important that this circuitry is in good regulatory control. I'm gonna show you examples of all three of those from our data. And I'm gonna kind of keep to those, but I wanna make the important point which you've heard about in some of the other talks, which is that that's not really how the brain works with just regions working in isolation. They're connected to all sorts of other brain regions. And interestingly, one that I would really like to highlight, although I won't be talking about too much further today, is something called the hypothalamus. And that's a structure really deep in the brain, subserving some of the most primitive brain func functions, sleep, appetite, 24-hour daily rhythms of sleep, and the hormones that change. The hypothalamus has strong connections to the amygdala as well as any part of the cortex to this ventral prefrontal part of the brain. So perhaps you can kind of imagine now this picture where you could have the emotion circuitry in between with its dysregulation, but because of the other connected areas, you can have that broad constellation of troubles that I mentioned before, the sleep and the appetite going along with the emotion dysregulation. 
So I'll now show you some of the data to support this. You've heard about some of this already. That's our MRI scanner uh, at Yale. I'll be showing you data from several different kinds of information that we can derive from a brain scan. The first is the structure, the size and shape and volume of some of these areas in the brain. Secondly, fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging, you've heard a bunch about. We could look at the activity in different parts of the brain, as well as how well different parts of the brain are working together in the circuit. And I'll actually be a little bit more focused than, for example, with Dr. Pearlson when he showed you those elegant resting state studies today. I'm going to more so show you the response of the circuitry to emotional stimuli. So if we show people emotional stimuli in the scanner, how is their brain reacting? And then finally, with diffusion tensor imaging, we can actually look at the structural integrity of the wiring in the brain. And so again, I'll show you evidence with all three of these for our model. This is actually, I am sneaking in one picture that's actually from PET scanning, from positron emission tomography, and work from before I was at Yale. I've been at Yale now for 20 years. But before that, I was at Cornell New York Hospital. And at that time, over 20 years ago, we really didn't have a way to look in the brain of someone experiencing symptoms, to look at the activity. Those technologies were just emerging. And so this was one of the first ways to find, the first tries at looking in the brain at someone who was experiencing symptoms of mania. And indeed, what we saw were decreases in this frontal part of the brain. Uh, as uh, others have alluded to, again, there are some complexities to that, and I'm also going to be flipping the brain around a bit, brain standing the way I am. If you then kind of slice through this way and you rotate it up, let's see if I can, you can see that. Okay, so this part is the frontal part, and again, I came to Yale, now it's fMRI scanning, it's new subjects, et cetera. And again, we're seeing this decrease in a similar area in individuals who are experiencing manic symptoms, saw some differences that actually are on the other side of the brain, which we could discuss in depression. And then also on the right, some, some differences in this frontal area that lingered even when individuals were not in acute episode and made us thought that maybe that relates to vulnerability to having the episodes. All of this, importantly, in adults. So we already can see the ventral prefrontal differences in adults. So how do you get to a developmental model of that? And so one of the things that we were really interested in was that different areas of the brain don't develop at the same time. So as I kind of alluded to, these more primitive areas need to mature and be functioning you know, all set earlier on. Then until you march out to the outside of the brain, this more complex stuff, that's going to keep maturing during later adolescence and early adulthood. So what we hypothesized was that here, for example, for the amygdala, by puberty or so, it would be relatively stable, whereas in prefrontal cortex, we know prior to puberty, there's the sprouting of neuronal connections, and you can see increases in prefrontal gray matter. And actually, after puberty, you can see decreases in prefrontal gray matter because there's the pruning back of these connections and the service of more refined and adaptive and mature responses. So what I'm picturing in green it's what's happening during ad in the purple area in adolescence and young adulthood in health. And this is what we were hypothesizing, that if the amygdala was already pretty much set, that if the amygdala would be important in bipolar disorder, we'd already be able to detect differences in the amygdala in adolescence. Whereas in prefrontal cortex, there might be a progression. The story might be progressing such that over time, there would be sort of an increased progressive difference in prefrontal cortex. So we wouldn't see the full differences that were going to happen in prefrontal cortex in adults in, in bipolar disorder until the adult period. And so I'm going to be showing you evidence related to that. And again, as I alluded to, that has you know, some different, very important aspects to it. it suggests that that's, that adolescence, also probably younger, I'm just not studying as much, 
but adolescence is a very important time of both vulnerability, where we have to be really careful about risk factors that adolescents are exposed to, stressors, sleep disturbances, substances, et cetera, but it's this very important time of opportunity where we might be able to prevent progression. Okay, so I'm gonna show you examples, first for the amygdala, and so this is from our structural imaging where we saw decreases in the amygdala volume, and they were already in the graph, that's individuals who are adolescents and adults, where we already saw the decreases in volume in adolescents with the disorder. So early differences in the amygdala. We also saw that it was red hot, basically, that it had excessive responses, and actually what the graph represents is the smaller the amygdala, the more excessive resp the responses, and that tells us something, gives us some hints about what might be happening, like loss of inhibitory cells that can make it smaller, but overreactive. So we're pursuing them. And importantly, something that you may have noticed is that there are some common circuitries that we've discussed over the course of the day in the different disorders. And so now what we're trying to do is use different types of inroads you've heard about and different technologies to get much more specific. So for example, we're now doing work at Yale using a seven Tesla magnet. So that's more than twice as strong as the magnet in our other studies to really look closely at different parts of the amygdala and these prefrontal parts of the brain to better understand which particular areas and what their neurochemical makeups are in the different disorders. Okay, so what about frontal cortex? And so um, what you can see here again, consistent with hypotheses, this is ventral prefrontal volume. In uh, adolescents, black individuals without bipolar disorder, white individuals with bipolar disorder. You can see that the volume's lower in bipolar disorder, but then you see the significant differences by adulthood. So it looks like perhaps they're in black in individuals without the disorder. There is that decrease we would expect in the gray matter but that it's more excessive in bipolar disorder. And what you can see below is we then did studies following adolescents over a two-year period and could ask the computer where in the brain are there more differences in the adolescents and young adults with bipolar disorder than without, and indeed it was in this frontal area showing more aggressive decreases. Very important point, everything that I'm talking about are kind of differences on average comparing two large groups. Very important, and I don't want to imply it is not the case that you could hold up one scan next to another and say which person has bipolar disorder. We're not, we're not there yet. Okay, so what about the connections? Connections, interestingly, are continuing to develop and grow and get violinated in this white insulated uh, fat covering uh, all the way into the 40s. And so now we're starting to look at what's happening differently in these connections in the disorder. This is an example of how we can actually look at structural integrity of the, these connections. We see them decreased in adults, specifically in that area of white matter that connects amygdala and ventral prefrontal, and then below, this is a recent paper um, by a trainee at Yale, uh, Dr. Judah Weathers, where he was able to show that there was a difference in the changes with age and with time in those connections. So a difference in the development of the connections in adolescence and young adulthood. I've alluded to we also are studying suicide and the link, and so just very briefly, this is some of the data that we have in a recent paper showing essentially that in the adolescents and young adults with bipolar disorder who made suicide attempts, these differences are more severe, and we'll have some work that will be coming out shortly that uh, shows that adolescents who go on to make future suicide attempts have more severe difficulties in these areas, which is an early, one of the first inroads into trying to find targets for prevention of suicide. Okay. So in this last part, I'm just going to go kind of quickly through the directions, the future directions of our uh, group. 
as you've heard from uh, several of the speakers, there may be multiple genes that are important in these disorders. So we have, with the circuitry stuff we've been showing you, kind of have a light on what circuits are important, maybe what developmental paths uh, kind of head there, but the real key is to understand if someone has a certain combination of genes, what are the molecular events that lead to those circuitry changes and those symptoms? And um, you know, very importantly, what Dr. Pearlson talked about was how in different families, for example, there might be different combinations of genes. So in families where psychosis runs in the family, there may be particular genetic combinations, particularly brain, particular brain circuitry differences and kind of different path, molecular paths along the way. And as we get better at understanding that, we'll be able, and I think the future is extremely hopeful, we're going to get better at being able to target someone's particular biology to best help them and also to help them avoid treatments that are not going to be as helpful for them. So this is just a very quick flash of how we're now starting to look at the different genes that are implicated in these disorders and how they may affect the different parts of the circuitry. And we're getting some different signals, particularly for some of these connections, that some of the genes that seem to be important in bipolar disorder might relate to differences in the connections. We've also done a bunch of work, um, and this is in collaboration with Dr. Sinha, um, who you heard from earlier, looking at stress, uh, and particularly early life stress and early childhood maltreatment. And just in brief, um, what you can see here are areas of the brain where there were decreases in gray matter in adolescents who had been exposed to maltreatment, which includes abuse and neglect and emotional and physical. And by now, through all these talks, you're probably experts to know that some of these areas of the brain overlap some of the areas in the psychiatric disorders you've been hearing about. So, you know, is there the potential that these early life stresses can worsen things? There's kind of that overlap. But very importantly, I want to get the point across, these are in plastic areas of the brain. So there's every reason to hope that there are ways to help to reduce the problems and to kind of realign trajectories, even if someone has had those kinds of experiences, to realign their trajectories better towards health. Uh, in terms of treatment, well, let me quickly say here, again, there's suggestion that treatments already existing and ones that are being very actively work, worked on can help to reduce some of these brain differences and realign these trajectories. So for example, there's a lot of very elegant work um, at Yale, Ron Dumont, and many other groups who have shown in the basic science studies that some of these treatments can actually help nerve cells grow particularly their connections, or prevent cell death. So these are, this is very complicated, but in that kind of black area that's inside a cell, and then if you kind of see all around that those are some of the medications, lithium, valproic acid, antidepressants, medications used to treat mood disorders, and how they're affecting different, different parts of these pathways in cells that can help the cells grow their connections and prevent the degeneration of their connections. We have a little bit of evidence from our studies, some proof of concept with medications, that medications can potentially reduce some of the structural and functional differences. And what I'd particularly like to point out today is that we have a, a new psychobehavioral treatment. And that's kind of thinking about targeting what these circuitries do so that we try to teach healthy habits so people can go on to utilize them through life to better regulate their emotions, and also to better ha healthy habits that can also better influence the health of these circuits, such as regularizing sleep. So right, you know, having regular sleep may also be very beneficial. And what you can see here is that here, before our Be Smart intervention, you see the red hot amygdala, and then after, um, in our early analyses, that has quieted, and now you see more activity in these frontal parts of the brain. So 
we're working on, on a line of research trying to show that these healthy, teaching these healthy habits and techniques to people can be helpful to their symptoms, but helpful to their brain. And that's a pathway to the help and the symptoms. Um, and then uh, last, we have a brand new study that's starting shortly. Uh, it's supposed to start May 1st. Um, and that is a new international consortium that we have. There are some hubs in uh, we're a hub, and there's a hub in the UK, and a hub in, in Australia. And that, again, is going to be a very large effort to try to study the brain related to suicide in adolescents and young adults to try to prevent, to, to try to move towards better prevention. So um, I tried to show you some of the circuitry involved, what I think are extremely hopeful possibilities that we have a lot of different potential targets and pathways to help this brain circuitry of bipolar disorder. We're looking at all kinds of molecular paths for the gray and white matter at Yale and other places, but also through changes in behavior and also bottom up in doing things like regularizing sleep. Um, and so just before closing, um, uh, I just want to um, make the point that, you were, of course, the research is all extremely important. But it's only so good if it doesn't get communicated, if there isn't the education, if there aren't folks that are willing to be brave and speak about bipolar disorder and other disorders, and also create um, major works of art that move people to be better thinking about it, and with that thoughtfulness about what they're communicating. And so um, the work is only this good unless we have people like Paul Dalio doing what he does, which is really very profound and very important. So we, we thank him for that. This is just some of my collaborators in funding.